What's up, you guys? Sean Ross Sapp here for the Fightful Wrestling Podcast. We're trying out a little something new. Going to bring you guys a very familiar face. Uh, you've seen him alongside the greats in pro wrestling. He is one of the greats in pro wrestling. The man is J.J. Dillon. J.J., how are you? Fine. How are you, Sean? I'm doing great. Uh, for this show, we're going we're gonna to talk about a centralized topic each time, unless... Unless Ric Flair does something crazy uh, one day, and then we might talk about that for a little while. If he goes and, and uh, that could be a, carries that could be a daily occurrence. That's true. This might turn into what did Ric Flair just do podcast. But one thing I wanted to talk to you about was your transition from WWF to WCW in 1997. Now, of course, all this is in your book, which you all can get on Amazon. It's also available on Kindle. What led to your departure from the WWF in 1997? Well, I was there. I was, let me back up. Um, the Horseman had a wonderful, wonderful run. And in the end of 88, uh, Tully and Arn, I don't know, for personal reasons, burnout, whatever, or if they felt that the run had run its course, Anyway, I had an opportunity to go to uh, work for what was then the WWF as the Brain Busters managed by Bobby Heenan. And when they left, for, for me personally, I felt that that was the end of the run of the horsemen. It continued in name with others, but for me, starting with the original group that had Ole Anderson to the transition to Ole out and Lex Luger in, and then ending up with Barry Windham, which to me was the, of all the incarnations, it was by far the best in terms of what we could, could accomplish from bell to bell in the ring on any given night. But as I said, Tully and Arn left, left, and for me that meant that the horseman, in my mind, the run was over. And uh, it was, I want to say October, probably. It was pretty late in the year. Um, Tully called me a couple of weeks later. Now, this was right about the time that Crockett was going through some financial problems, and it was evident that money was tight. And But the ratings at TBS were continuing to do well. So... Uh, there were negotiations between the Crockett family, Jimmy Crockett and Ted Turner, and Ted Turner ended up making an offer to buy the company, which would give it sound financial footing and a lot of other benefits that they talked about. And I got a call from Tully, basically, uh, I believe the, the after the due diligence, November 1 was the date that the contract was actually signed, where... Turner took it over and renamed the company World Championship Wrestling, which was the name of the program on TBS on Saturdays. And basically, Tully, and Tully said to me, uh, you know, I don't know if what your situation is there, how happy you are, what have you, but he told me that all of the matchmaking, all of the television, writing, production, etc., was being done by... Vince McMahon and Pat Patterson, just the twosome. And that the WWF was running three towns, three tours each night. And at that time, I want to say there was five or six major pay-per-views. And he said they need help with just the two of them and that my name had been mentioned and thrown around and some people there who knew me spoke highly of me. And he said, so if you're interested, uh, depending on your situation, uh, make a call and see where it goes. So that's how it got started. And I called um, Terry Garvin, who I'd worked with uh, at length for almost a year in Kansas City. I worked with him in Amarillo after Mulligan and Murdoch had bought out the Funks. So I knew Terry, who ran towns. And he was uh, in charge of the ring crew at the time very close to Pat Patterson, who was, again, the one that was working hand-in-hand -hand with Vince on creative. So I called Terry, and as it turned out, Pat was close by, put Pat on the phone, and 
it led to me going to New York uh, around the holidays and then sending a, a limo into Manhattan and met me at his home uh, in Greenwich. And he said that no one at the office knew that I was coming because uh, I'd come by car. And he said, uh, I, I want to protect your options. And at that point, I, my contract that I had had was expired with the, with Crockett, just hadn't gotten around to redoing a new contract. And with the due diligence of the turnover, I believe it was Jim Barnett at the time who was uh, in Atlanta. So, oh, we need, we need to get you in and talk about your contract again. And I, I kind of low-keyed it and said, oh, that's a big problem. We'll get around to it. And I wanted to really keep my options open. So I met with Vince in his home in Greenwich. And uh, he told me, made it clear that he was not interested in me as a, an on-air talent, that if he hired me, I would be walking off camera and that he would be utilizing my, from what he had heard, my attention to detail skills and whatever. How did, how did that make you feel? The, how did that make you feel being told that you wouldn't be on screen? Um, that part really didn't bother me. I mean, I loved, uh, I, I would be less than honest if I didn't say that I, I enjoyed uh, working on camera. I felt very comfortable in the, in the character uh, that had evolved. My first, a lot of people don't realize that, that uh, my active career as a wrestler slash manager was about a 20 year period of time. And my dream from the beginning when I was a teenager in New Jersey was uh, to be a professional wrestler. And when I finally got my foot in the door, which was with uh, Crockett Promotions when Jim Crockett Sr. was still alive, the first five years, uh, I was a full-time wrestler and never really thought about managing. And I got a phone call from Archie Goldie, the Mongolian stomper, who I had wrestled in the Canadian Maritimes. Uh, after Charlotte, the Maritimes, I went to Willow for a year, a couple tours in Japan, and then went to Florida. And Stomper was wrestling in Florida at the time left to go to Tennessee, I believe, with Bearcat Wright as his manager, and that didn't work out. And I got a call out of the blue from uh, Archie and said, uh, you know, things didn't work out here with Bearcat. I've got to get out of here. I called. He said, I've got a main event spot in Dallas where Fritz von Erich uh, owned the territory. Red Bastine was uh, the, the booker in charge of creative. And he said, I got a top spot, but I don't have a manager. Have you ever given any thought to it? which I hadn't. <laughs> I said, well, I mean, I knew because when I started in the business, I was 28, close to going on to 29 years old. So I knew that the length of my active career would be somewhat shortened by the fact that I got a late start. I also was realistic about my own skill level that I did not have a a, a body like uh, superstar Billy Graham or Lex Luger or Hulk Hogan or what have you. And to be honest with you, I hated going to the gym. <laughs> so my strongest <laughs> skills and, and what I really worked hardest at were my interview skills. And I really tried hard to be different than every everyone else and kind of establish my own style. And so it would be a natural transition from wrestler – doing interviews as part of what I was doing. And I, I was very proud of what I accomplished in my wrestling career, helped uh, uh, championships in, in the various territories. But, you know, this was an intriguing idea. And as they say in life, there's one door closes behind you, another one opens up. So I said, I, I really got to talk to Eddie Graham and, I, and see, you know, if he would be give his blessing and let me leave. And Eddie was uh, very gracious about it and said, this sounds like a great opportunity for you. And so uh, I made the leap, went to Dallas. I had to buy some clothes uh, to dress up a little bit. It's funny, I remember the late Red Bastine, who was a wonderful, wonderful guy. I had wrestled him a couple of times. I remember him sitting in the office with Stopper and saying, well, let, let me see. He said, the Mongolian Stopper managed by Jim Dillon which is the name that I had used. He said, just 
or something missing there. It just doesn't grab you. So after a real short conversation, Jim Dillon became James Dillon. And he said, now that sounds more business-like. He said, but you should have a middle initial. So I became James J. Dillon uh, at the beginning of my managerial career. And it stuck with me for from, from there on out. and was short dolphin to people calling me JJ. Hey, that's one of the reasons I adopted my middle name. It's more memorable. It's it's easier to, it's easier professionally for people to remember. Now, obviously, you you were with WWE for several years, and we'll talk about some of those things as, as they arise on, uh, in future shows. But when did when did you know that the writing was on the wall, wall with WWE? Was it what is it? But it, ah, was it a progressive thing, or was it just a happened one day situation? Uh, it was. A progressive thing uh, if you look back at the history of people that have been there in that position it's kind of like the, <laughs> the press secretary for the for the current president in the United States um, he is the one that has to go out there on the press conferences and try to explain to the media what the president is actually saying and to add credibility to it and at the same time know that the minute he steps through the door the first face he's going to see is the president as to whether he uh, um, has a smile on his face or a frown on his face so it's a it's a it's a tough job um, it, to kind of simplify it Vince McMahon takes credit for everything that's good and, and takes no blame for anything that he feels is not good and in that position, you're you're kind of the person who uh, um, all the negativity is reflected on. So it, it's a tough job in that sense. And I, at the same time, to be honest, and if you, you mentioned my book, Wrestlers Are Like Seagulls, I devote a lengthy chapter to my time with the WWE. And when I started wrestling, I knew because it was late in my career that I had to kind of pay attention to the other aspects of being matchmaking and television production and how putting the show together, because if I was going to have any longevity in the business that I love so much, um, this, this would be a, an area where I could have some longevity in my career. So, uh, and I was around some of the greatest minds uh, in Amarillo. Uh, I had only met Dory Funk Sr. one time and he passed away while I was up in the Canadian Maritimes. But just being around Dory and Terry, uh, Art Nelson, even when I started in the business, being around a guy like Johnny Weaver was uh, uh, a very smart guy. Ole Anderson, who's been a friend since I broke into the business, he was in Charlotte when I broke in. And I learned a lot uh, from making trips with Ole. So I was like a sponge with each territory. And to me, the highlight was when I finally went to Florida. Uh, Eddie Graham had the reputation of being a brilliant mind in, in the industry and had a tremendous influence on successful people like Bill Watts and Dusty Rhodes. And I knew from having been in Amarillo that there was a similarity in philosophy and what have you with, in other words, what I'm, where I'm going is I think that Eddie Graham absorbed a lot of his approach to the business, the psychology of the business really could be traced back to Dory Funk Sr. because he was very much like Eddie from everything that I'm told. So. Uh, I was like a sponge everywhere I went. I was interested. Some guys go and they're interested in their match from bell to bell. Don't even think about the rest of the card. Uh, I tried to look at the bigger picture. And the other thing is with the, with the regional territories, every territory was different, had a different philosophy. Like Eddie Graham in Florida was big into credibility because you look at people like Jack Briscoe and Hiro Matsuda and Bob Root and and all the guys that uh, were legitimate uh, amateurs or successful amateurs or, or tough guys in the business, the Harley races of the world and what have you. Um, whereas if you went to Tennessee with, uh, with uh, Jared, Nick Goulas, uh, it, was a, it was off the wall crazy up there, entirely different. Uh, worked around Detroit with the Sheik, same thing. Crazy, crazy, crazy different. Yet, 
because they each produced their own television show, they kind of controlled and educated their viewing audience, which is where their towns were that they promoted to what was their vision of wrestling. So there was no rubber stamp say wrestling is this. Wrestling was many, many things. And I, I tried to absorb uh, all the different approaches and kind of this was uh, like tools in my toolbox. So uh, when I was approached by Vince, um, it, it, I, I mean, how many times could I keep being a special attraction on the card wrestling Precious Paul Ellering because the Road Warriors were on top that night? I mean, I couldn't do that forever. So... Uh, I was kind of flattered that, uh, and the other thing was when I broke in, I was a referee for a part-time basis for about eight years and held a job and was around Vince McMahon Sr. quite a bit who would come to the big shows once a month in Philly. And he knew me by name, was very kind to me. And so now here I am towards the tail end of my career and here's uh, Vince Jr. as he's now expanding worldwide from there, uh, basically uh, re recruiting me to go to work for him. So it went full circle from McMahon to McMahon and um, a chance to do what I wanted to do, which was prolong my career. So it was it was an easy adjustment for me, and I didn't mind the thought of that I was going to walk off camera. So what was that conversation like with Vince McMahon? Was was it a firing situation? Was it a you leaving situation whenever you left the WWF in 1997? Well, let me back up. When he hired me, he said, you know, I'm, I'm hiring you um, to go off camera and for, for other skills. And he told me at the time, he said, I'm hoping that you'll consider my offer uh, based on this conversation. No one knows you're here, and I did it for a reason to kind of uh, protect you. And he said, if you want to go back to Atlanta, as there's now Ted Turner taking over ownership, and if you want to go back and use it as a bargaining chip to get the best deal possible with them because I have interest in you, I, I, I would have no problem if you doing that if that's what you decide to do. But he said, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm generally interested in having you come here. So I asked for 24 hours to think it over, and I, the uh, girl that was with me who became, this, became my third wife within a year later, and we got married up there uh, in Connecticut, um, realized that uh, this was a chance of a lifetime that I should, should take it, So, which I did. And what was different was in all the small regional territories, I wore about eight different hats from – being involved in creative and, and matchmaking and travel and doing all the aspects that are involved, uh, running, running, going to a town and taking care of everything. And now Vince McMahon was on a much, much larger scale. And he had full-time professionals doing what I used to do, one of eight small things on a much smaller basis. And the other thing that was unusual was that they weren't all wrestling people. Many of them were professionals. And the only thing Vince said, okay, I, you don't have to be a wrestling fan to work in an executive level would mean not referring to me, but these other people. The only thing he did expect was that they watched the television, follow the product. Uh, at the same time, Vince is not the easiest guy to work for. He's a... Uh, um, He's a 7, 20, 24, 7 guy, loves to work out, never takes a vacation, um, and can be pretty demanding. So I was Monday through Friday in the office with a suit and tie on, and most of the creative was done on weekends, dressed casually in his house in Greenwich. And Pat and I would be there, and we would sit around, and, uh, and also – he would like chart the television shows as to which talent, how, when was the last time they were on, say, super, was Superstars and Challenge were the, were the uh, two syndicated shows. And he would track so that some guy wouldn't get lost in the shuffle. So it was a very professional approach, different than anything that I'd been around. And over the, almost, I wasn't there quite eight years. I was there seven years and 10 months. But I then kind of transitioned over 
to taking care of travel, which I had done before, uh, and not so much uh, of the week-to-week uh, creative side of it. But there were some things there that um, were personal that bothered me, um, one of which was a, pri- a primary thing that I can't talk about because uh, – Basically, I was told that if I made any statements, you know, that they would sue me. So you can kind of connect the dots and figure what that might have been about. And I, I, I realized that. Uh, and then the one big thing was I rented a house when I first went there. And then I had children. I had twins born, one of which has special needs. Uh, my son, Jeffrey, we almost lost him at birth. Uh, and he has cerebral palsy, but it's a mild form, cognitively great. And then we had another daughter that came as a surprise two years later. So I had three children <laughs> uh, that I'm now responsible for. And I, the people that I rented the house from finally wanted to sell it. Well, it was okay as a rental, but it was kind of a the style of the house wasn't something that I would have wanted to buy. And then um, working at the house with Vince, I said, well, I said, I need, I need to look around because the house where I'm staying, the people want to sell it. And he said, well, you, you got to buy a house. This is your home. You're going to stay here. You're, this is it for you. You're, and um, he said, I want you to go looking and called uh, Doug, uh, who was the uh, chief financial officer at the time, right while I'm sitting there, Doug Sages, he says, I, I want him to go through our bank whatever financial problems, if there's any tax things or anything that uh, I wanted to buy a house and stay here. This is, I want to make it my home. So um, found a house, everything up there, unfortunately in Connecticut is very, very expensive because of the land values up there. And they're not even brick homes. They're uh, mostly you get out, and the out of the city of like Stanford, I was up in Wilton and everything was owned like two acres up there. And you didn't get much of a house for $400,000, $500,000. So um, it ended up that I took what I had in my retirement fund already. And it ended up I signed a personal note for the difference in order to buy this house. And it wasn't a secured note. It was just a note. And we're... It's in my book, so I'm not giving anything away. It was, I think, initially it started out as about $180,000, but I was paying back on the note with interest. This was around the time that Vince was charged for, by the feds for uh, uh, distribution of controlled substance. And it looked like for a while, as hard as the government was pursuing it, that Vince kind of made you think, well, hey, when they work this hard at you, they're going to get you for something. And he never really said, I think I'm going to do time. But he, he wanted to make preparations in the event that the worst thing happened. So he used to joke and tell Pat, you know, you guys will have to come visit me on visiting days or bring your yellow tablets and some pencils and we'll do the booking that way. Uh, when he ended up uh, and was found um, – not guilty he had a meeting in the cafeteria with all the employees in the new building and he said that he had taken a hit of about five million dollars for legal fees to see this thing through he said now i've got to really tighten my belt tighten the belt with the company cut is everywhere and anywhere that i can but the good news is now i can give 100 percent of my efforts towards uh Back all the all my concentration will be on the business to get it up where I know it can go. The problem was that uh, between a Friday and a Monday, my salary was cut forty percent. Now, Ooh. most people, when you have a, a set salary in a business and you know what your mortgage is, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you can imagine what the impact of that was, and. Um, I made a, a, a decision that day that uh, anybody that would cut my, if he had gone all across all management said, look, I need everybody to take a 5% reduction 
until I can get this thing turned around and then I'll restore it. But he cherry picked the quote unquote wrestling people. And he used to, to, uh, he used to talk to us and say, Hey, you got to stop thinking like a wrestler. You're an executive now. Don't be thinking like a wrestler. And yet when it came time to make these cutbacks, he took and made dramatic cuts to mainly the quote unquote wrestling people that were in his company. And the only one that, that said no and took a walk and went out the door and, and God bless him. Uh, I, I respected him then for it. And, and, and I'm talking about Lord Al Hayes. He said mm -hmm. no and, and walked out the door. Everybody else took it. I had no choice. I had a house. And, but I knew at that point, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, I just couldn't stay there as a matter of principle. And it took a year and a half before I sold the house. The house uh, sold. Um, I had to get out of there. Didn't have another job. The house was supposed to close on Thursday. And for some reason, there was some little complication that it wasn't until Friday. And so on that Friday, a mover had already moved everything out of the house. And I rented a, a place in Atlanta, not because I had a job there, but <clears throat> I felt that WCW was there. I may be attracted to them. If not, Jerry Jarrett over in Tennessee uh, might have something. Worst case scenario. I was on my way to Orlando with all of the uh, entertainment things down there that there was a good chance that I might find something. Having been a, a, a vice president of talent relations for a big company like that. So on Friday, Vince was in the office. I had my letter and uh, uh, about two in the afternoon, uh, I heard his voice in the hall and I said, Vince, can I talk to you for a second? He said, yeah, come down there. So I walked down. And I said, I came to your house and met you face to face when you hired me. And when I've made a decision, um, I want to do it the same way and meet you face to face, man to man. And so I said, here's my letter of res resignation. And if you want to talk about it, fine. If not, that's fine, too. And he said, oh, by all means, I want to talk about it. So we went into his office and we had a pretty intense conversation, just him and I, for about an hour. Got up, I walked out, took a couple of the things off my wall. Uh, we were on the fourth floor. Vince was at one end, Linda was at the other. My office was in the middle. Uh, HR was on the second floor, took the elevator downstairs. I said, here's my ID, my keys, et cetera, et cetera. Down to the basement, got in my car out the door. And as I was walking down the hall towards the elevators, Vince opened it. Hey, Pally, do you need a hand with anything? And I said, no, Vince, I think I got it. Um, Basically, Vince didn't see it coming. He got blindsided by yeah. it. Maybe he thought that I wasn't serious. I wasn't going to do it. Do, do you think he ever sees anybody leaving coming? Because it seems like this type of conversation is a recurring theme. Like when somebody wants to leave, he's. it seems like he's like, well, what could possibly be wrong? Yeah. Yeah. He. Uh, I, I, I don't know his thought process, but uh, I had made up my mind. And I put myself in a position where uh, I signed off on a, a, a authorization for my wife to close. And she told me that the house had closed. We were free and clear. We had about, I took about a $50,000 loss on the house. We had $20,000 cash in our hands, had twins, one of which had special needs that were like four years old at the time and another baby that was two years old. And I was walking out the door with 20 grand in my pocket and no job. So it was, um, you know, some people thought I was crazy. The people that would dream about being there, especially in that position and, uh, and as a matter of principle. Um, and I, and I, I mentioned it in the book, I looked at Vince and I, and I, I told him, I said, Vince, for us to do business together, you don't have to really like me personally. And I actually don't have to like you personally, but you have, I have to respect you because you're who I'm working for. And at the same time, there's a level of respect that I think I'm entitled to from you. And I said, at this point, 
we, we've reached a situation where I've lost all personal and professional respect for you. And the reason I'm handing you my resignation and walking out the door is that I can't put work for you one more day. And um, the, the awkward part of it was Shane was being married the next day. Ooh. When was, when was the next time you spoke to Vince McMahon after that? Um, it would have been in Orlando when Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels rest, wrestled each other in what was to be that retirement match, so whatever year that was. I would say wow, so, close, so, close to 10 so years. So over a decade. Over a decade. Later. Yes, over a decade. Now, I had done a couple projects in between. <clears throat> I got in a call when they were doing the DVD, Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen, but it was a TV producer that called me and, and, and said, uh, you know, we want to do this thing and you were such an integral part of it. Would you be open to, if we sent a TV crew to your house, I was living in Delaware where I still live and, um, you know, we will pay you and, so that's what we ended up doing, and they put comments from me in, ter in terms of the package put together, and I received probably a little bit more than what I would have if I'd been under contract at the time. So that DVD did extremely well, but I got no residuals because I had no contract. It was just paid me for the interview time. And then uh, uh, another period of time went by, and I got a call from uh, another producer trying to think of the sequence. Uh, Howard Finkel called me and said when uh, Flair was uh, having his quote-unquote last match if he lost to Shawn Michaels, that on that Monday on the Live Raw in Orlando, they wanted to do a, 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 a tribute in the ring to Ric Flair, and as a surprise, they wanted the horsemen to come out because we were it was a hot town for us. And Barry Windham was already working there at that time. I want to say Arn was working there at that time. And, of course, Flair was too. So Tully and I were called. And, and this is like WrestleMania Sunday, and the call from Howard Finkel was like on Wednesday. And he said, would you be open to coming down and, and participating in this? And I said, sure. And he said, well, so we're just talking about it. It's not definite. I got a call the next day and they said, we want to do it. We'll send you a plane ticket. And so Tully and I flew down to Orlando, actually while WrestleMania was live. And then uh, the next day went to the arena. Um, I saw Vince. We were, I, I got there early, like 11. And the live show comes on at, you know, like eight at that time. And I saw Vince at the far end a couple times up on the set doing some things. Uh, doing some things but didn't really have any conversation with him and they didn't really tell us a whole lot uh john laurinaitis was uh in charge of talent relations came to me uh, came to us while the show's on the air it goes off at 11 and around 20 25 after 10 he says well it's going to be coming up in the in the next segment or so and he said we want you to come down there and he said we just want you to come out uh, Triple H was going to be in the ring with Rick and it's, oh, we got some surprises and it was going to be us first and didn't say anything more to us than that. And so we were kind of lined up, uh, at what they call the gorilla position. And there's a small trailer right behind the entrance curtain and sitting in there was Gerald Briscoe and somebody sitting next to him on a monitor that were queuing, queuing you. Okay, go, go through the curtain. And then kind of in an L shape. Uh, I remember Stephanie McMahon, who was pregnant at the time, had a headset on, and right next to her was Vince. And since we were first, um, the other guys went up. Uh, Tully, Tully was right in front of me. Vince looked up and saw Tully, stood up, took his headset off, reached out, shook hands with Tully, and, and thanked him for coming, and saw me standing behind him, reached around him. JJ, appreciate your comments, stuck his hand out. I shook hands with him and I said, you know, thank you for inviting me. He sat back down. We walked through the curtain and got an incredible response from the fans that were there that night. I mean, it was, <laughs> uh, uh, Flair was crying. We were all crying. It was, uh, 
it, we I guess we, we didn't expect after all those years that we would get the kind of response that we did. And when the show was over, Vince was already gone, never did see him. And so that was the first time that I saw him since that day that I resigned. So did you approach WCW for a return or did they approach you? Well, I, as I said, I didn't have a job. Um, another part of it was that uh, I went – my my secretary's father was a lawyer and it ended up Vince came down right after I left in a panic where am I you know wanted to know where I was I don't know he left and went down I think to human resources story is he ran down the stairs and just missed me at human resources came back to her and said if you any way you can get in touch with him or whatever you know he was desperate to talk to me now that it hit that I was I was gone, and um, so it ended up that I agreed to call Vince at home that night, and Vince was there, and I could hear Jerry McDivitt's voice in the background, and and it was a brief conversation, and Vince said, "Well, you know, I uh, I, di I didn't realize whatever the issues were that we had talked about," and he said, "I." He was under the impression that I was going to go in town with Irv Mushnick and and do some kind of press conference and a big expose or whatever or spill my guts and say some negative things and I and I said Vince, I I was I told you honestly why I was leaving and that was it. I walked out the door with no other intent. And I remember Vince saying, "Well, you've restored my faith in humanity. I want to do something to try and make it right to you. Can you come in?" And we were already halfway to Boston. We had got tickets for the weekend to go see the Red Sox. And I said, well, there's no way I can get back there. And he, he said, well, call Human Resources the next day. I said, Vince, tomorrow's Saturday. There won't be anybody there. He said, somebody will answer the phone when you call. And so when I called the next day, somebody answered the phone. And they proposed uh, what would have been a very fair severance, for lack of anything and would, which would have included uh, a lump sum payment to forgive the balance of a note, which at that point I had paid down to about $130,000. Uh, but when they cut my salary, they, they froze the note, but again, it still had interest bearing. So um, they faxed it to me, and I said, well, I, I want to show it to, to a lawyer. And the one thing was I remember what he did to Dusty with the polka dots, and I hand wrote on the side of it with the, with the lawyer on the highway. I said, I want him to acknowledge that I own the rights to the name of James J. Dillon or J.J. Dillon, that he agreed to not create a character using or similar to the name or similar to the likeness since I had owned those rights. So yeah. technically, I did not take the agreement as it was written and just sign it and accept it without adding anything. <clears throat> so the next day, uh, got on a plane, went to Atlanta, and that was on Monday. And I got up expecting, you know, to hear something from the lawyer that maybe the thing was finalized. So at least I would have income. And uh, I called the lawyer, and the lawyer says, well, I got up and on the floor about 3 o'clock in the morning, a letter came in where they had pulled the deal, and they cited three different things, none of which were were factual, but that really didn't matter. They had pulled the deal. And so now I didn't have a job. So I had known Tony Schiavone for years. I said, Tony, I don't know what you've heard, but I said I legitimately walked out, quit, did not have a job, did not talk to anybody. And I said, I've never met Eric Bischoff. And I said, uh, you know, could you see if there is any interest at all in me? And uh, Tony called me back and he said, Eric, we definitely want to meet with you. We set up a time and I went in, met with him. And as it worked out, it was right after Time Warner had merged with AOL and there was a hiring freeze. So he said, I can't hire you, but I can bring you on as a consultant for a month. And then when the hiring freeze ends, you know, offer you a job. So, so this, this was your first time meeting Eric Bischoff, correct? Yes, correct. 
So what, what was that first meeting like? Did you like him? Did what, what were your impressions of, of an Eric Bischoff? Well, again, I had, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. And I, I thought that here's a guy who, um, is talking with somebody who's been an executive level for, with Vince McMahon. And, and I didn't expect him to pry into any proprietary information that, that would have been illegal for me to divulge, but I did expect him to want some general information about the process and how things worked. And in other words, he, he could have gleaned a lot of information because it, it was with Vince, I learned a lot. And if you read my book and look at it, I think I, it's very balanced in terms of I learned a lot working for Vince McMahon putting some personal things aside and it was a, a, a great experience in terms of my growth of, of my career, even at that late stage. And I, I really thought that the, these were the kind of things that I was going to get from him. And to my surprise, um, all he talked about was uh, how much longer can he hold on? You know, he was obsessed with thinking that he was going to put Mr. Man out of business. So I did more listening than I did anything else. And I was not about to tell him because I did need a job. I had a family to take care of. I certainly wasn't going to tell him that he was crazy, that there was no way in the world he was going to put a company like that out of business. Whereas WCW was one small division of a broadcast company as opposed to Vince McMahon, head of a wrestling company and, and in the third generation. So do you, do you uh, think that was do you think that was part of his interest in you was trying to pick your brain about where WWF was financially or as a business at that point because you were pretty fresh off of that run. No, I, I didn't get that feeling. I, I I got a feeling of just somebody that was more telling me what his goal was and that uh, he thought that his goal was very. Uh, achievable because the ratings were so good and we're, you know, I don't know how much longer he can hold on. We're going to put him out of business. And, and the big difference was that, that Vince understood the wrestling business. And as I said, it was 24 seven with him, which made it awkward to work with him in time. But by comparison at WCW, there was nobody in upper management that had any knowledge about the wrestling business. So whatever Eric Bischoff told them, they accepted. And he told them whatever he wanted to tell them. And I mean, I heard the story that his his uh, education in the wrestling business was being a gopher to go get coffee for Vern Gagne. And um, so I really was not impressed in that sense. Uh, but he was in a position that one thing is that, that he's great at, certainly – far superior to me, and that is he's a great salesman, presents himself well, and can really sell the sizzle. It's just he gets in trouble when it comes time to serve the state. So was the on-screen commissioner always going to be your role? No. Uh, that was something that, that came along after. Uh, uh, in, in fact, when he hired me, he says, well, I'm bringing you on because he said there isn't a position that I'm looking to fill. It's not like there's an office down the hall with a name on the door that's that nobody's there and I'm and we're we're looking. So I've got to create something. So he said I initially he said we'll probably <coughs> just call you an agent. And then uh, I said, Well, I, you know, I always am here to do whatever and I have uh, a very varied background and I'm sure that there's gonna be places that I, you know, can be of help to you. And whoever signs my check, I'm devoted to 100%. And I'm, I'm here to help you. And um, later on, they got the utility idea to make me an, Actually, they wanted one announcement uh, and about a match coming up. And they said, well, you've done this kind of thing. You'd be great for it. So I remember we had moved out of CNN Center and were outskirts in a, in a where the power plant eventually was as well. So we went back to CNN Center, used one of the offices in the upper level. They had a camera crew in, 
suit and tie sitting behind this great big huge desk and whatever announcement that they wanted me to make you know it was like a one take thing which it, all, all the people were there it was all one take well that's it and, and so that's where the seed was planted well we should be able to utilize you maybe if we made you commissioner or something and i said you know whatever you want it wasn't something that i wanted or or uh you know, uh, lobbied for it was. Well, we'll make you commissioner, and, and so that's that was a transition to be an on-camera character, and uh, not the way that I envisioned in my career. As we wrap this up, what kind of changes did you notice in this new WCW that you were taking part in, as opposed to the maybe eight, nine years before that? Also, uh, what kind of reaction did, did a Ric Flair and an Arn Anderson have to you returning? Um, I had a great relationship all through my time with Rick, with Arn. Uh, uh, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall came in, and so they were very comfortable with, with me having worked up there, and they, of course, were already down there. And yeah, they were bringing in a lot of former WWF guys, so you were yes. familiar with a ton of this roster. Right. So, um, you know, that, that was, I, I think, a, a good thing. Um, what I noticed was over a period of time, because Eric did not really have a solid foundation in the wrestling business, the one thing that stuck out of me was Vince McMahon would meet with talent at TV and they would have a lineup of chairs outside. You'd have to have like an appointment and you would meet individually one-on-one -on -one at TV, which was like every third week. Um, very professional in, in its approach. Eric and Vince after TV would never go out somewhere and drink with the boys. When we would do TV every week live, Eric would, would be at the bar, get hammered, the talent would sit there and wait and watch until he got blasted out of his mind. And then they would say, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And want to want to discuss business with him. And then the next morning, the phone would ring and, and they would put the call through to me first. And I, it would be so and so. And they would say, well, last night I talked to Eric uh, after TV and we had a discussion and I asked for this, this, and this for this reason, and Eric told me, agreed to it. Yes, I can have it. So I said, well, let me put you on hold for a minute. I call Eric, and I say, Eric, I got so-and-so on the phone who indicated you two had a conversation last night after TV in the bar, and that you agreed to give him. And the well, first thing he would say is, well, why don't you call him? He said, I really don't remember exactly what we talked about. Why don't you ask him specifically? you know, what, what we talked about or what was said. So actually it was a two part call on my part where I would go back to him and say, Eric's tied up at the minute, just told me to have you share with me what you guys talked about. Then he would, they would tell me and I'd go back to Eric and he said, well, you told him that you would give him this, this, and this. He said, well, I guess if I did, then I did go ahead and, and uh, put it in motion. So the talent knew how to play to Eric they would wait till he got drunk and, and manipulated him. And Eric was uh, basically giving out checks with somebody else's money, which eventually caught up with him. Um, when he started, I, the production budget went from a reasonable level to it just skyrocketed because there was no one there again from a wrestling background who could question some of the things that he was spending uh, when sting had the crow there was a guy who was a special effects guy from california who would fly in the live tv every week have two seats because the crow would sit in a cage next to him on a seat where my mentality was okay if you're going to do the crow thing with sting the only place you use the crow he would usually be sitting somewhere on the set which was the same every week even though it might be the beauty shot from way up behind, it would be, be it would have a different look in the arena. But when they would go to the shot with the entrance of Sting with the Crow, it was the same set. So my mentality was the 
first week the crow was in there, I would get as much video as I could, put the crow here, put the crow here, move it over here, get this, get that, and then the next week be able to edit that in rather than pay for two plane tickets from California to wherever. That's just an example of where there was no accountability for the money that was being spent. And then um, when he went live every week and Vince was every other week, uh, the classic example was when they changed the title on the uh, the edited show that the, that the WWF did the, the other week. And Eric said, oh, uh, I think it was um, – Mick Foley or somebody won the title. I said, so you don't even have to tune in over there to look or switch back and forth. I'll tell you already now what the outcome of the match was, that so-and-so won the title. And if you looked at the ratings for that particular week, you see the min min minute that Eric told Shivani to make that announcement on camera, the ratings flooded over to the WWE to see the title switch. Again, Eric's lack of knowledge. So before we go, what do you, is there anything else that we didn't touch on about your transition from WWF to WCW that, that maybe people don't know? I, I think bringing up that, you know, you were familiar with large part of this roster. I mean, there was Jeff Jarrett, Virgil, Mike Enos, Barbarian, Mike Rotunda, Duggan, Ray Trailer, the Nasty Boys, the Steiners, Sean Waltman. You had worked with a ton of these people over the previous years. So it wasn't like you were walking in. Like, I mean, maybe it was like the new kid at school type of thing, but I mean, you had been there before you had worked with these people before, but anything else that, that people might not know about that transition? No, not really. Uh, I, I think I was successful and had longevity in the business for the reason that I had done it all. I had been a referee. I had been a preliminary wrestler. I had been what they call a baby face. I'd been a heel. I had been a manager. I worked behind the scenes learning uh, all the nuances of, of how it's put together beyond other than just worrying about one particular match. So uh, I had – and my approach was always – that when I, I was usually the one that was the bearer of bad news, as I had said, Vince never wanted to be the one to have to give out any bad news. He just wanted to take credit for the good things. So if, as contracts became a big part of the business, there was a clause in there that said within 90 days that the office could serve notice that they weren't going to renew the contract. And it was always done by letter from a lawyer and lawyers could be very cold with legalese, and they would go in a FedEx envelope and be sent to the talent's house the same as uh, airline tickets and other things were. And potentially, if a guy's at the gym and uh, an envelope comes, it would not be unusual, say, for a wife to say, oh, it's just another envelope from the office, probably his tickets, and make sure they're in here. Open it, and there's a letter saying that your contract is not being renewed. So I, when I went up there, changed and said, from this point forward, no letter goes out if that decision has been made, which was above me, uh, until I have made a personal phone call and kind of told this individual that this letter was coming and had a chance to talk about it. In other words, I had walked a mile in their shoes and knew – even with bearer of bad news, guys um, respected me for showing them respect of saying, hey, this thing is coming so you can sleep on it. Maybe think about how you want to break it to your wife, talk about what your options are for the future. And because I had walked a mile in their shoes, um, they didn't like the fact that they were getting bad news, but at least it was done with an element of respect. And so that gave me longevity in the business. Well, JJ, I want to thank you for joining us. Guys, uh, viewers, listeners, readers, let us know what you think of the show, what you, would want, what you would want us to hear us talk about on future shows. Obviously, JJ Dillon has been through a lot of stuff in the pro wrestling world, including that run uh, in WWF from, I think, what, 89 to 97, where – 
It was, it was some big time. In 96 that I left. It wasn't quite a full. Uh, okay. Full. So uh, quite, quite a run there. Quite a run there. Uh, and, and again, as I said, I, I learned a lot. It was, uh, I grew uh, in terms of my education. It was another chapter in the education of my business. I learned half a, half a century of my life has been involved in the wrestling business. And it's something that you, that it's forever changing and you never stop learning. And I learned a lot there. Um, and I have no ill feelings. Uh, I'm in the WWE Hall of Fame. Normally, I should have put my ring on to, to show it, but I have it real close by. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm proud of the fact. And, and in fact, uh, was a little bit shocked given the circumstances of my of my leaving and how I left that uh, the decision was made to uh, induct the Four Horsemen in 2012 in Miami into the WWE Hall of Fame and it was made clear that it included me and that that was with uh, with uh, Vince, Vince okays everything. So I, I kind of uh, I was a little bit surprised and that Vince uh, personally presents before you go out there, each of you, your ring to try on and and personally presents you individually with your ring. So that was uh, that was an interesting conversation that maybe we could say for her for uh, for another time. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Let us know any recommendations. Of course, visit Fightful.com. Until next time, we're out.